There we go. Hi everyone, this is Julie Borowski. Welcome to the third edition of Washington Unmasked with me. Today we have a very special guest, Congressman Thomas Massey of Kentucky. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me on, Julie. Sure, and just so the viewers know, probably everyone knows you, but just in case, you represent the 4th District of Kentucky. You're also an engineer. You went to MIT. You invented some cool stuff. Also, I know everyone at Freedom Works loved you. You got the Freedom Defender Award. You have high ratings, so thank you for that. Well, thank you. Thanks to Freedom Works. Sure. So my first question is, you're an engineer. Why did you run for Congress? How did you get involved in politics? Well, you know, engineers like to fix things that are broken, and this looked like a very broken thing to me. But uh, how did I get involved in politics? Well, you know, I like building things, so I went to college and invented some things and started a company and built that up to about 70 people and raised venture capital. And um, that was all exciting. I did that for about 10 years, moved back to Kentucky and decided I want to live off the grid, on a farm, where my wife grew up, so we built a house ourselves. It's totally off the grid. It's run by solar panels. I tell Republicans, don't hate solar panels, okay? <laughs> uh, you can hate the subsidies, just don't hate the panels because they're really cool rocks that make electricity. But anyways, uh, I love technology. We built this house, just minding our own business. And then I noticed our county government started to like decide they're going to do zoning and they were going to pass new taxes. And so I started going to some of the county meetings, and I wrote letters to the editor, and I riled, I guess I riled people up, you know. So they came to the meetings, and we stopped the taxes, and we stopped the taking of our property rights through zoning, and people said, you should run for office. And at the time, you know, I was backing Ron Paul for president, and, uh, in, you know, when he ran the first time, and then Rand Paul was running for Senate. This, this wasn't, he wasn't running for Senate yet, but I decided, okay, what the heck, you know, I read this essay on the internet called The Dog Catcher Strategy. It's on the Lou Rockwell site if somebody wants to look it up. And it says, you know what, everybody wants to be president, but nobody's willing to be dog catcher. And there are 3,000 counties in the United States, and all of those have offices to run for. And even if you get your guy in the White House, if you don't have your people all the way down the dog catcher, you're not going to really affect change. So I ran for one step above dog catcher. I ran for this county office called County Judge Executive, which is like mayor of the county. And I beat a Republican incumbent two to one in a primary. Sound familiar? Anyways, uh, so I... It was like a dog catching a bus. What do you do once you catch the bus? Because I've been going to these county meetings and complaining. Now I had the key to the courthouse. And uh, I remember the first day I put the key in the courthouse and unlocked it. It felt like breaking and entering. It did not feel like a place I belonged, much less had a key to. And so I got in there. I found, I'll just go quickly. I found waste, fraud, and abuse, uh, exposed it, ex uh, went to different counties and told people how to find waste, fraud, and abuse in their county. And then our congressional seat opened up, and I said, wow, there's a lot of waste, fraud, and abuse there. Maybe I could help with that. So I ran for that position. Awesome. Well, good to know that. You've identified as a constitutional conservative, libertarian-leaning Republican. Have you always held those views? I think so. You know, uh, I'm the, the other terms people use to describe me are hillbilly, <laughs> uh, geek, nerd, redneck, high-tech redneck. Uh, but where I grew up in Kentucky, we have hollers, okay? People live in hollers, and it's sparsely populated. And uh, sort of one of the rules there, nobody called it, nobody was really thinking about it as libertarianism, but we just sort of thought, you mind your own business, and your neighbor, neighbor can mind his business, and um, if he doesn't hurt you and you don't hurt him, then that's probably the best way to live. And so that's the way I grew up. And uh, I remember when I went to college in 1993, there was this galvanizing event for me. Uh, it was uh, when the Waco, that, the place in Waco, the Branch Davidian compound, they call it a compound, I don't know, living quarters, whatever. It burnt down and, and dozens of women and children died there. And I saw government tanks 
coming in and the military was being used and supposedly they were helping those people and be, um, you know what resulted because of ostensibly because of drug crimes and maybe polygamy and maybe uh, gun crimes things where nobody really was being hurt outside of the people themselves participating in it the government got involved and really ended up with a cataclysmic outcome and it bothered me that Republicans and Democrats were both sort of saying oh well they had it coming and you know the Democrats didn't like them because they had guns and the, and the Republicans didn't like them maybe because there was polygamy involved or drugs and um, it, it really it bothered me a lot so that's one of the things I think that galvanized for me that maybe the two parties aren't always right and maybe our government's just a little bit too big. So you've been in Congress for a few, few years now. You've compared it to the TV show House of Cards. Uh, could you explain what you mean by that? Maybe give an example or two? Sure. So, you know, I first started watching House of Cards and in the first season, second episode, there's a congressman that does cocaine uh, with a constituent or something to get some dirt on another congressman and I'm like all right this is totally fictional I can't bear to watch this I, I work in a real Congress this would never happen within a few weeks later the congressman that I sit next to on the floor of the House of Representatives got busted for buying cocaine two blocks from the Capitol like that was gonna work out real well for him I don't know what he was thinking but I realized I need to go back and watch House of Cards because it was more true to life than I realized so what I noticed, they use the same furniture, they have the same telephones, the, the same sort of backroom deals are being made, but there was this one big difference between House of Cards and real life Congress that just ruins the show for me, totally ruins the show. And um, people ask me in town halls, what's the difference? And I tell them, look, in, in House of Cards, there is a guy who has a plan. <laughs> there, I haven't found anybody here with a plan. Like, that's the biggest surprise for me at Congress. It's like crisis management every week. And if there needs to be, something needs to get done, they create a crisis to sort of motivate everybody. That's the really disturbing thing. I'd feel better if there was somebody with a plan. What surprised you the most about being in Congress? Uh, the dysfunction, the fact that everything is so disorganized. We don't know when our votes are going to be. We don't know what we're going to vote on. And sometimes until just a day before the vote, we don't know what's going to be in the bill because they kind of hide that or they don't know what it's going to be until the day the bill comes up. So I guess it's like all of the dysfunction that's sort of built into it is my biggest surprise. I'll tell you the other biggest surprise. I guess you can have two biggest surprises. Anyways, the, uh, the other surprise I had was that all these committee assignments have price tags associated with them. In mm. fact, um, I get a bill for how much I owe the Republican Party for the the uh, seats that I occupy on the various committees. That's shocking. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, there's like I'm overdue, like three years overdue. I keep getting a bill that shows how far behind I am. There's virtually no way I can ever catch up with my dues. They call them. That's a euphemism for extortion. But we're basically all extorted uh, for our committee assignments. Now, I don't serve on any A committees. I serve on committees that are important to my constituents, but they're just not important to lobbyists up here. And so you can't raise a lot of money on these committees, so they don't charge you a lot for them. So one of the committees that I serve on is the Transportation Committee. That's important to my district, but it's not important to the lobbyists up here. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, I had no idea about that. So what advice would you give to a liberty lover who wants to run for Congress? Oh, I have tons of advice. <laughs> uh, let's see. You know what I did when I ran for office the first time is I Googled how to run for office. Okay, I don't <laughs> recommend you do that. Uh, although I did get some good, get some good advice there. Uh, what would be advice? One thing I, I like to tell people is don't major in political science. Oops. Now, yeah. I did. Oh, you did? I'm sorry. Yeah. It's not a science. Sorry. No, not, um, not offended. Go on. But anyways, um, 
I think having a career in a in a field before you go into politics is is a good thing. Maybe uh, build it, having a family, um, making a house payment or a car payment, or just living in the real world before you get into politics is a good thing because before you think that you can write laws that are going to affect everybody else, maybe you should live a little bit in the world that you're going to be regulating or legislating for, or in my case, deregulating, hopefully, uh, or delegislating. So my advice is get a, get a real job first and uh, go do something before you get into politics. All right, I'll keep that in mind. Um, the next question is, have you been able to find common ground with Democrats on an issue? I know Rand Paul has found common ground on criminal justice reform. Have you had some success there? I have found uh, a lot of common ground with Democrats. Like, this is a, in fact, I spent uh, 10 minutes on the floor today talking with Zoe Lofgren uh, about a bill that we're working on together. She's a Democrat from the Silicon Valley area in California. And we worked together on NSA reform a lot. In fact, we had two amendments this summer that passed um, in the House of Representatives by an overwhelming majority. And we got Republicans and Democrats both to vote for those amendments. And uh, unfortunately, those amendments will probably end up in the trash can because of the leadership we have. They don't really want to do an omnibus, or I'm sorry, an appropriations bill. They would rather do an omnibus bill that they get to write behind closed doors so that they can ignore all the legislation that happens on the floor of the House. Okay. Um, my next question is about the speaker race, which is all over the news. Uh, who are you supporting for speaker? I am supporting Daniel Webster for speaker. Uh, you know, his Freedom Works score and all that, I guess, is not as yeah. uh, conservative, if you will, as mine is. But... You know, I told you one of the biggest surprises here in Congress was the amount of dysfunction. And Daniel Webster has experience with dysfunction. The Florida State Legislature was dysfunctional, and then he took over as majority leader and um, brought function to that body, and that's what I would like to see. He talks about pushing the pyramid of power down. Instead of concentrating it all up here at the top with one person, pushing it down and letting the rank-and-file members actually uh, – have control in the legislative process. That really appeals to me. It's sort of a scary notion because who knows what's going to come out of that because it's not paternalistic where mm -hmm. one man is determining the future, but mm -hmm. uh, it's more akin to what I think our founding fathers uh, intended when they set up this institution. So I'm supporting Daniel Webster. I hope he wins. Uh, there's some other guys running. But we don't have to mention them unless you do. <laughs> no, we have to. No, I'm okay with it. Um, I asked people questions for you, and okay. uh, Matt, Matt Kibbe, who you may be familiar with, asked, why aren't you running for speaker? Why am I not running for speaker? <laughs> you know, I, th I think it, the way the job is defined, part of the job is fundraiser-in-chief. And, uh, you know, Speaker Boehner has traveled all over the country. His weekends are spent in other states instead of his own district. And I think it's tough to represent your constituents and also just to be home with your family if, you're, if you have a job like Speaker. So mm -hmm. it's really a job for an empty nester, I think. If you didn't have kids, it would be a lot easier job to uh, apply for, sign up for. I'm not, I'm under no illusion that I could get elected, but uh, I just, uh, I think, honestly, I think I should have more experience before I run for speaker. Yeah, I don't blame you. I think that job, you get blamed for everything, so I wouldn't want it. Well, um, you know, if you did it the way Daniel Webster says, which is to give <laughs> the power back to the members, yeah. you can blame the members at the end of the day. <laughs> So I think a lot of people don't understand how you get bills voted on on the floor. Could you kind of discuss that? Yeah, well, it, it, when it's supposed to work the way the Founding Fathers intended, it's kind of like Schoolhouse Rock mm -hmm. where somebody introduces a bill, and I've introduced several bills, and then they go to committee, 
And then the committee has a hearing, and then they have a markup where they debate and amend your bill in committee, hopefully to improve it. And then they report it back to the House floor where the whole House hears the bill, and then they can amend it. And then you have a vote on the final product. Then it goes to the Senate. And, uh, well, the Senate has to be doing this in parallel, or the Senate could just pass your version. But there's usually a Senate bill and a House bill. Then you, you come to some compromise between the two. Then you send that back to the two chambers. And then if it passes both chambers as identical bills, then it goes to the president. Of course, he can veto it. But that's not, that's not the way things have happened here recently. So uh, let me tell you the dystopian version, okay? Okay. <laughs> the lobbyists on K Street get together with the speaker, and they tell them what they want. And then the bill gets written by some staffers, and it just magically appears on the floor, having not gone through committee. And then it shows up for a vote, and the rules committee writes a special rule for that bill so that nobody can offer amendments to it. And all you get is an up or down vote in the House on it. And then you're told, you know, this is a really good bill. If you want a better committee assignment or if you want us to help do a fundraiser for you, you really should mm -hmm. vote for this bill. And mm -hmm. then it gets passed, and the identical path happens in the Senate. And the lobbyists have already been talking to the White House, and so the skids are greased, and boom, you get legislation. Not, not a good way to run the country. Aye, aye, aye. Yeah. Well, I know you mentioned, to go to another topic, you've mentioned that you live off the grid. I know you've yeah. said that you love the environment, but normally when people hear Republican, that's not what they think. Uh, could you touch on how the government hurts the environment and what you would like to be changed? Sure. So, well, let me give you the, the libertarian um, rationale for not polluting, okay? So there's something mm -hmm. called the non-aggression principle. This is basically don't, don't break other people's stuff, right? Yeah, or don't take it from them. Yeah, don't it's punch people. Kibbe. Yeah, Yeah. what's Matt Kibbe's book called? <laughs> don't uh, hurt people, don't take their stuff. Yeah, okay, so <laughs> that's basically the libertarian manifesto, right? Well, if you pollute somebody else's property, you have, you have violated their rights. So I don't believe that you have a right to pollute somebody else's property. So we you know we can argue about whether carbon dioxide is really a pollutant. I don't believe it is. But in fact, I'm trying to get more carbon on my farm. Things do better with carbon. Uh, they, they grow better, when it, whether it's in the soil or in the atmosphere. So to me, it's actually really beneficial, but um, we don't have to go there. But anyways, I think uh, it's very irresponsible to leave the environment in worse condition for our children than we found it, just like it would be irresponsible to leave them with a bunch of debt, federal debt or federal obligations, okay? So, yeah, I like the environment. Uh, I like nature. And uh, I, don't, I really don't think that Republicans are against the environment. I mean, this is a, a misnomer, this sort of mischaracterization of the Republican Party. And certainly libertarians aren't uh, polluters, if you will. So I may be what you call a crunchy con. Uh, you know, a conservative, I think the crunchy part comes from granola, uh, but who likes things in their natural state. So like the cattle that I raised, the grass-fed cattle, I have some four uh, food slash farm freedom bills in Congress that would make it easier for small farmers to prosper and for consumers to buy from their local farmers. So I've got two bills to make it easier to obtain and sell raw milk. I've got a bill that makes it easier to buy meat from your local farmer. And I've got a bill that would legalize the uh, growing of industrial hemp. And all of these things are actually good for the environment and they're good for people, consumers, and business all at the same time. And that's why I have like Democrat co-sponsors for all of those bills too. Okay, great. So on raw milk, what do you say if someone says, well, it's dangerous for someone to drink raw milk? Vegetables are dangerous, you know. 
all kinds of germs in there. Uh, raw meat is dangerous, right? I yeah. mean, it's but it's not illegal to buy raw meat in the supermarket. And when you get it home, it's up to you whether you want to cook it or not. True. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I think it's unfair to single out milk. Now, the interesting thing about raw milk, <clears throat> each state has their own laws. And I would leave it up to the states to regulate raw milk if they want to or if they don't want to regulate it. Uh, that's really a state's rights issue. But, you know, the federal government will come in and with a SWAT team and raid your farm and, you know, put your family in a room and go uh, confiscate your equipment if you sell raw milk to somebody in another state from your state because they, they claim that you're – because you cross state lines with it, you could – you violated a federal law. Now, here's the interesting thing, Julie. Congress never banned raw milk. Like, there's never been a bill to ban it. The, um, some do-gooders, and it was actually probably funded by the milk industry, to be honest. But somebody, with some funding, sued the federal government, sued the FDA, because they weren't regulating raw milk. And they said, you're not doing your job. And this was in the 80s. And the FDA said, you know what? This is such a waste of our time. We are not going to regulate raw milk. And um, they got sued in court, and the FDA lost. So overnight now, the FDA goes from not regulating raw milk to now saying it's illegal and, uh, you know, basically banning the interstate sale of raw milk, even with though Congress has never passed any law against it. So the, the simplest of my two raw milk bills, what it says is if it's legal in Kentucky, if raw milk is legal in Kentucky and raw milk is legal in Ohio, then we won't send in SWAT teams and black helicopters and SUVs with you know assault rifles to raid your farm if you take the raw milk from Kentucky to Ohio, from a state where it's legal to a state to another state where it's legal. That just seems like common sense. And so I try to think of the most common sense raw milk bill I can introduce, and that's the one I came up with. Yeah, that does sound like common sense. I know they've raided Amish farms for this, which just sounds crazy. But on hemp, why, why is hemp illegal? Well, first of all, it shouldn't be. It's ridiculous. It's mm -hmm. legal in every third or uh, industrialized country in the world except for the United States. They grow it in Canada. They grow it in China. They grow it in Europe. And... Uh, I can't tell you why, I can't give you a good reason why it's illegal. All I can tell you is that it is illegal um, and that it shouldn't be. And so that's why I have a bill called the Industrial Hemp Farming Act, which basically it's the same bill that Ron Paul introduced, but I'm up to 64 co-sponsors on this bill now. I think um, perceptions have changed about industrial hemp, and uh, we actually got an amendment that legalizes industrial hemp is as long as it's for a quote research program. So we got that passed in 2013 and believe it or not the president signed it into law and so there were like a thousand acres of hemp grown in Kentucky this year but it had to be associated with a research program. The bill that I'm trying to get passed now would allow all farmers to grow industrial hemp. Oh great, hope that passes. Um, back on the environment, what are your thoughts on climate change? I don't know if I've ever heard you talk about it. Do you think it's man-made, natural? I think it's turned into a, a religion for people. Mm -hmm. Like they're clearly like about 90% of the population has an opinion on it. <laughs> and <laughs> it's just that, like without facts, all you have is an opinion. Mm -hmm. These are not climatologists. These are not uh, scientists. Uh, yet people have formed an opinion and they've, they've dug in, they've got their trenches dug and they're not moving. Uh, even if they get new facts, they won't be dissuaded from their current position. And uh, you know, the climate has been changing for hundreds of thousands of years. And the problem with the view I would say from the left right now is that uh, they won't tolerate any dissension. That's why. That's another reason. It's sort of like a religion. You you can't stray at all from their ideology right now. Uh, and then I think it's wrong for politicians to tell people how to live their lives when the politicians haven't even yet themselves started living that way. 
So the, the irony is I don't want to pass um, any bills to regulate carbon dioxide. Yet I have a house that's entirely powered with solar panels. Uh, so there's the, and you know, and I drive an electric car. There's mm -hmm. the irony for you. Now there are people with personal jets, you know, uh, flying all around, jet setting around the country, talking about the evils of carbon dioxide, um, yet they're doing nothing about it. So I think rule number one, don't be a hypocrite. This, this town's full of them. <laughs> I know that. So I looked <laughs> on your Facebook page, and you're you've introduced a bill called the Senior Citizen Tax Elimination Act. Uh, can you talk about that? Sure. So this is actually a Ron Paul bill. Oh, cool. Uh, and before he had it, I think there were there were actually people that are still in Congress that would never get near this bill right now that were sponsors of it. You can go back and look. But anyways, I've taken up the charge. And I'm trying to get this bill passed. And here's something to think about. And people, people on the internet watching this right now will say, no, he's wrong. He can't be right. But if you Google this or go talk to a tax attorney, you will find out that I'm right. So if you've got a pay stub, get out your pay stub and look at it. Now, the Social Security tax that you pay is a percentage of your uh, pre-tax earnings. Okay before the taxes is taken out. So you pay the highest amount possible into your Social Security. People think that that part of your income is therefore deducted from, your, uh, from the income that you have to pay federal income tax on. In other words, they think it's like a 401k where you don't have to pay tax on that money as long as it goes into Social Security. Guess what? Look on, look on your pay stub again, you still owe taxes, federal income tax, on the money you put into Social Security. You have to pay it every year. And you don't get it deducted on your uh, 1040 tax form either. So you've paid taxes on that money that goes into Social Security. Now, fast forward, you get into your 60s, you retire, you start drawing Social Security, and uh, Almost half of Social Security recipients end up paying taxes on their Social Security again when it comes back out. Because of a law that was passed in 1984, they said, you know what, uh, people with a lot of money in retirement, they should pay taxes on their Social Security income. So they set the cap at like 30000 40000 if you're married, because that was a lot of money in 1984. And they said, mm -hmm. so the rich can be, they're able to pay uh, taxes on their Social Security. Well, guess what? They haven't adjusted that number in 30 years. In fact, they've raised the amount of tax you have to pay on Social Security when you take it out. And so what only affected maybe 5 or 10% of the population in 1984 now affects almost half the population. And <laughs> half the population ends up paying taxes twice on their Social Security. So I'm trying to, what my bill does is it says when you draw the money back out of Social Security, since you pay tax on it when you put it in, you won't pay taxes on it. You don't even report it on your income tax. Oh, okay, great. That's good to know. I was hoping you could talk more about Social Security, especially when it comes to younger people. I mean, my generation is paying and we're not going to receive it. What's the solution? So, well, I would love to let you opt out. I want to opt mm -hmm. out. I would mm -hmm. like to. Uh, when I ran for Congress, I said I'm going to uh, opt out of the congressional pension because I knew Ron Paul did that. Well, they changed the rules, so now I still have to contribute into the congressional pension, but I signed a, you know, an affidavit and put up my employee file that says I'm still not going to take it, even though you're making me pay into it. But uh, I think you should be able to opt out of Social Security and uh, pay into your own retirement. Most people think that Social Security is a compulsory retirement account, it's not even that. You're not even really, there's no separate account for you set up anywhere with your money in it. You're, the money you're paying in goes straight to retirees. Um, there's a little bit of surplus in there like uh, to adjust for changes in demographics, but you're right, in about 2029, 20, 2030, that surplus is gonna run out and the payments that are being paid in won't be enough to make all the payments paying out. Now, it won't stop immediately. People will think the world has ended, 
But actually, what the actuaries say is that you can still make three quarters of the payment. So, Julie, when you uh, are in Social Security, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, you like technically you'll probably get three quarters of what the government's promised you right now if nothing changes, because that's mm -hmm. just the way the demographics work out. It's not likely you'll get nothing, but it's very likely you'll get less than what you paid in. <laughs> Yeah, I would like to opt out. <laughs> um, on another topic, you've talked about declassifying the 28 pages on the 9-11 report. Um, what do you say to someone who says, well, those pages are classified for a reason, this is a national security threat? Well, they're classified for a reason, probably not a good reason. They're probably classified because mm -hmm. they were embarrassing to our government. Uh, so that's my, my first answer. I can understand why maybe they were embarrassing to the Bush administration, and so, or maybe um, they didn't fit the, the model of foreign policy that the Bush administration was putting out there for public consumption. And then, um, but I don't understand why President Obama doesn't release those pages. He could do it tomorrow. Like, yeah. That, that's actually within his executive action purview. He's allowed to release that information tomorrow. It, contrary to popular belief, it doesn't take an act of Congress. It wasn't an act of Congress that kept those classified. It was purely the Bush administration's decision. It was not Congress's decision to classify those 28 pages. So that's uh, so the, the thought that they're classified for a reason, no, I don't think they're classified for a good reason. Now, the notion that it could be dangerous to our national security. I've read the 28 pages, all 28 pages front to back. Uh, if I don't think it's dangerous to our national security. In fact, I think it's imperative for our foreign policy that people uh, get a chance to see those 28 pages. If we're going to do, if we're going to prevent another 9/11, then shouldn't we want to know what caused the first 9/11? So I think it's imperative for our national security those pages be released. If somebody thinks that there's a source that's maybe compromised or disclosed because of something in those 28 pages, you could redact a sentence or a word here and there, and you wouldn't have to redact the whole 28 pages, which is mm -hmm. what they did. So I say release the 28 pages, uh, release them tomorrow, and I've co-sponsored this a, a bipartisan resolution calling on the president to do that. Congressman Walter Jones, who I'm a big fan of, is the lead Republican on that, and then Congressman Lynch from Massachusetts is the lead Democrat. Interesting. You would think, even if it was just for political reasons to embarrass the Republicans, that Obama would probably do that, because I know he did that with Gitmo, and Republicans said, oh, this is just to embarrass us, so interesting. Uh, you mentioned Walter Jones. I know a lot of libertarians know of you, Justin Amash, Walter Jones. Is there any other congressmen who are doing good work that are not maybe as well known within libertarian circles? Well, um, it's easy. It's easy for me to tell you who my favorite, two favorite mm -hmm. freshmen are. Okay, so you know we got all these freshmen. They made all these campaign promises. They wouldn't vote for John Boehner. Etc. 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 They would come up here. They'd never vote for a debt ceiling increase. Blah blah blah. blah. And uh, most of them sold out on day one. Like mm. the very first vote they took, Julie, they broke a pledge. So that was disappointing to me. But there, there are two freshmen up here that just are head and shoulders above the rest um, in terms of fiscally conservative policies. And they are, I would say, libertarian leaning. Although I would call them more constitutional conservatives, okay. and they 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 both start with B, call them the killer bees, Dave Bratt and Rod Blum. So Dave Bratt is from Virginia. He's the guy that beat Eric Cantor. I call him Dragon Slayer. And then um, Rod Blum is from Iowa. He's from a district that President Obama won. Like generally. You know, people that win, Republicans that win those districts that come here to Congress, they complain and say, oh, you guys are conservative. It's easy for you, but I've got to get reelected, and I'm in a tough district. So, uh, you know, you should cut me some slack when I vote like a Democrat because I've got a lot of Democrats in my district. 
Rod Blum comes up here, and he, he's a business guy, a small business guy in the true sense of the word. He just wants to do the right thing, and he does, like, time after time. I'm so impressed with this guy. And he may lose his next election. He doesn't care. That doesn't, like, get in the way of him doing the right thing. I am, he is, he's a brave man, and so is Dave Brad. Awesome. Good to know. So I know, especially on Facebook, you caused some controversy lately because um, of Kim Davis. You defended her on the whole gay marriage, Kentucky thing. Uh, could you clarify what your position is on that? I would love to. Okay. <laughs> so Kim Davis, uh, this is an interesting case. The federal court that heard this, that actually the judge that put her in jail, he's from my district, and actually 40 miles from my house. Although Kim Davis, per se, is not a constituent. She's in another congressional district, but right near the border. Anyways, here's what concerned me about that. And, and interestingly enough, Ron Paul and I have the same view on this before all the libertarians like send in all the hate mail or whatever. What bothered me about the Kim Davis case is a woman was put in jail for a nonviolent crime by a federal judge ostensibly for not doing a state duty. Without a trial, without a jury, she was just placed in jail. Now I understand the, the legal procedure that was used. A case was brought against her, a civil case, in a federal court, and a judge issued an injunction. Now his job in issuing that injunction was to decide what would prevent the, the uh, most irreparable harm. Would putting Kim Davis in jail prevent irreparable harm to the uh, other in, to the injured parties, the ones that were claiming injury, or would uh, waiting for the case to be found out and just leaving things the way they were would that cause the least amount of harm? And I think it, what caused the most amount of harm was to put her in jail, and if for for ostensibly for something that was not going to be a crime or a civil infraction even after our state legislature meets. Like our state legislature intends to meet and say that county clerks don't have to put their name on the wedding, on the marriage license. And so, uh, you know, our state law is in a state of flux. You can't have laws unless they're written down. All of our laws were thrown into a state of flux. The legislature hadn't got to meet yet. And a judge just went in and threw her in jail. And I don't think libertarians should celebrate that outcome, that somebody was jailed for a nonviolent crime. Now, you might say, well, she infringed their rights, uh, you know, the rights of these couples. And Julie, But, Julie, what's important for people to understand is Kentucky has 120 counties, and so that means 120 county clerks and 83 Walmarts. It's easier to find a county clerk to get married than it is to find a Walmart in Kentucky. And you can go to any county to get a marriage license. So I don't think there was irreparable harm done to the couples that couldn't get their marriage license at that county clerk's office because they can get it at any county clerk's office. And there were several of them issuing it. So I just think on the whole, it, was, it looked to me and it felt to me like the heavy hand of the federal government coming in, punishing a woman for noncompliance and without a trial, and uh, I thought it was wrong. It didn't feel good to me. And so, I, yeah, I stood up for her, and I'm not <laughs> You got a lot of hate. Yeah, I, I don't agree. I got some love, you. too. I got some love. And yeah, some I do think it was overboard to throw her in jail. She's not a threat to anyone else. So, yeah, that was overboard. There's another issue that is kind of controversial with libertarians with you, and that's intellectual property. Uh, right. There's a big debate going on. Um, some libertarians parents believe that patents are wrong because it's just government trying to enforce monopolies and restricting competition. What is your thought on that? Well, I was looking for my constitution here on my desk somewhere, um, but they cleaned off my desk before this before we did this webcast thing. <laughs> oh, here's a constitution. I've got plenty of them in my uh, desk drawer, fortunately. But Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the Constitution Said and you know our founding fathers gave this as a duty to Congress. Said that the uh, the inventions and and uh, creations, you know, writings of authors and scientists and whatever 
would belong, that Congress, in order to promote the useful arts and science, sciences, should give to the inventors and the authors a limited period of exclusivity to their ideas, to their works. And um, so the mandate for intellectual property is in the Constitution. So libertarians can be mad at me for, for being for intellectual property, but constitutionalists should not. And uh, I should disclose I have 29 patents, and I probably wouldn't be in Congress. Like, if I weren't able to make a living by coming up with ideas that nobody had ever thought of before, and then um, selling those ideas. Now, some people think that you shouldn't be able to sell an idea. Some libertarians disagree with that. Now, what's interesting is some of the libertarians in history, like the writers, uh, the notable libertarians, believed in copyrights, but not mm -hmm. in patents. Now, I think it's a little disingenuous because they made their living by writing that mm -hmm. they were able to believe in copyrights and not patents. Uh, both are ideas that you're coming up with, and they cost nothing to copy uh, the idea. So from a libertarian standpoint, there's really no difference. But the people that make a living off of copyrights try to say they're okay, but that patents aren't. Now, let me, do, let me tell you something where I disagree with the current state of the law on intellectual property, and that's this notion that copyrights should last the life of the inventor plus 70 years. Like, that's a ridiculously long period of time. The mandate to Congress by our founding fathers in the Constitution is to promote the useful arts and sciences by granting uh, exclusive use for a limited period of time to the authors or inventors. And life of the inventor plus 70 years is, doesn't seem like a limited period of time, particularly when Congress intends to extend the 70 years to 90 years when the copyright on Steamboat Willie would otherwise expire. Like they're basically trying to protect the entire Disney archive, okay? Uh, that's what Congress is doing, it's cronyism They've disregarded the Constitution, and they're extending copyrights for like ridiculously long periods of time. So I, I think really there needs to be a limited period of time. But let me tell you what's going on in Congress and why I'm so fired up about this issue. There are big companies here in Congress that are trying to weaken the patent system, not to help the little guy, because what patents do is they help the little guy negotiate with the big guy. Big guys have the marketing, they have the economies of scale, they, they have everything going in their favor, and if they see a, a good idea from a little guy, they just copy it if there isn't a patent. But the big guys are tired of this. They're really tired of actually having to pay for ideas. And so um, they would just like to, in my opinion, steal them all. And they're here in Congress, they're giving gobs of money to congressmen in an effort to get us to weaken the patent system. And so I've been fighting that here in Congress. And so there's some libertarians on one side, some libertarians on the other. Some people don't believe in intellectual property. I get that. I don't agree with it. Our founding fathers didn't agree with it. But keep this in mind. Like one of the reasons our country is great, and this is a libertarian notion, is that we protect property rights in this country. And you can't have capitalism without property rights. There has to be something, a clean title to, of ownership before somebody will invest in it. And um, that works for ideas just as well as it does for land or buildings. Hmm. Yeah, I'm kind of torn on the issue myself because I'm a huge Taylor Swift fan. And I know she gets a lot of hate from libertarians who say she's anti-Spotify. She wants people to pay for her music. But I'm like, okay, if I was in her position, I would probably take the same position, but I'm not. So I kind of have to put myself in her shoes. And I think a lot, a lot of libertarians aren't good at empathizing with other people. So, you um, know, what? I this uh, this I think is a problem. There are some there are some uh, I could make some people mad with this statement. Uh oh. <laughs> there are some, there are some libertines mm -hmm. that claim to be libertarians. They want a certain outcome. They'd like to be able to, uh, let's say, have drugs, have uh, any kind of uh, arrangements, marriage arrangements they want. Like, and, they, and they're not concerned whether they get to that outcome through libertarian principles. They just want that end. 
uh, and the means justifies the ends, or, or the ends justifies the means for them. And it, and for some of them, it's the same way with intellectual property. Again, now I'm going to get some hate here, but there's a whole generation of people that have grown up copying music because it's so easy to copy on the internet and downloading movies for free, and they want to feel good about themselves. So they're trying to develop a model. They're, they're looking for an ideological model that works for them, that makes them feel good about all of the stuff they've copied. And uh, I would suggest that working backwards and saying that intellectual property is bad because I have all this uh, moral guilt about copying all this music. Like, that's not how you get to that position. But anyways, I think some people mm -hmm. have. And they latch on to like, yeah, there shouldn't be intellectual property because I've got 10,000 songs stored on my hard drive and I didn't pay for them. And that's oh, right. interesting. You still want to feel guilty about it. Hmm. Yeah, so you know what? Go, go be a fan of somebody that wants you to copy their music for free. Like, you know, and, and some people do that. Hmm. So there's another show coming on at 10, but just a couple more questions. Um, what are some key bills and events that are going on in Congress that people should be watching out for? The one I would say is this uh, omnibus bill that's coming up the week before we go on Christmas break. Ooh. You know, supposedly, like, I'm castigated here in the House of Representatives for being a fiscal conservative, and the adults in the room, you know, want to fund the government responsibly. Well, their definition of doing that is to create a crisis every three months. And so when we passed the CR a few weeks ago, most people don't realize it only funds the government for about 70 days. The so-called adults in the room have created a crisis to happen right before Christmas break so they can compel members of Congress to bust the budget caps. They, the, the only victory that we've had recently is this sequester, and that now Republicans are against the sequester. When it was like the only thing we've done to cut spending, and what's going to happen, watch the news, it doesn't matter who wins the speaker race because the president wants it and Republicans want it. They want to bust the budget caps, and the president will spend more money on social programs, and Republicans will spend more money on the military. Watch out for that. Mm. So how can we have an impact? Um, do you can calls to congressional offices work? How can we make our voice be heard? That's a great question. I always had this impression that the best way to do that was to write a letter to my mm. senator or congressman. No. no. I would tell you the most effective means of communicating to your congressman is a phone call. Without a doubt, bar none, make a phone call. And don't call somebody that's not your congressman or your senator because they're going to be like, okay, okay, thank you very much, and they're not writing any of that down. Make sure you call the people that you can vote for because those are the only ones that are going to listen to you. But make the phone call. Don't send a letter. If you make a phone call, a real person in an office here, like right here next to mine, if you call my office, I might not take the call, but I hear the phone ringing, and I know something's mm -hmm. up, and other congressmen do too. So. Phone calls matter. Okay, I good. get like 10 phone calls a day. I'm not asking people to call me, but most congressmen only get about 10 phone calls a day. If they get 50, they get really worried. My, so my thank you for your time, Congressman Matt. Go on, sorry. No, my web stream's breaking up. But thank you very much, Julie. Oh. Thank, thank you. I know you're extremely busy, so I really appreciate your time. Thank you. And just to the listeners, uh, if you want to sign up for Liberty.me, if you write Julie on the code to sign up, you can get 20% off. So that's cool. And uh, please stay tuned at 10 o'clock. Students for Liberty Live with Steve Horowitz is coming on, and that should be fun. So please stay tuned for that. And thank you again, Congressman Massey, for your time. Thanks, Julie. I'm a big fan of your YouTubes. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Bye. Bye.